and uh, a lot of the people who are on the FAO map and uh, in terms of London Ridge do not have uh, enough, uh, enough resources are first of all people, farmers, who cannot live out, out of their land out of what they are going to generate out of their land and this is something that, uh, that we have to address and when I say we, I mean, this is uh, all the people who are working in the domain of agriculture through finding out you know, how to, to, to be able to uh, give those resources to farmers the means to be able to develop their activity so that they will be able to live out of their farm and this is going through training and education to make sure that they know how best to optimize their farm but this is also by giving them access to micro credit that will allow them to make the first investment that will create uh, this uh, positive cycle I make an investment, I'm going to generate more out of my land, my profit is going to raise, I'll be able to send my children to school, but also I'll be able to reinvest in my farm, and so on and so forth. And for this, I mean, everybody has to play its part. The industry, we are doing a lot of training. Microcredit, we need to find the appropriate organisms to do, to do so, and so on. I hope I answered your question. I just address your question about the, uh, the concern about consolidation. And I think that if you look at India, you'll see that consolidation isn't as large a threat as, as people fear that it is. Because essentially an economic decision on the part of the, uh, the large corporations that hold these technologies, that it's actually better for them to license the technologies to the smaller companies that have different job files and have different market share and have different reputations. And that's what's been happening uh, in India, because uh, and as well as the United States and then it's actually uh, one's turning off. Uh, so I don't think that's nearly the, the problem that it is. Okay, uh, next question. Yes, Ajay. <coughs> um, I'm Ajay Kohli from uh, IRI, the Rice Research Institute. Um, I just have a small question for Dr. Riordan. Um, in excluding out the three to four intermediaries from farm to uh, market, how much of the profit is actually going back to the farmers? That's, that's one part of it. And the other is, um, does, does your study have any comment on what those intermediaries are doing after losing their jobs of being intermediaries? Just a quick, quick uh, response. One is that, um, in general, the, in the case of um, rice, it doesn't seem that the consolidation in the post farm gate really brings uh, larger profits to farmers, I would say. I think that um, it creates value added opportunities and quality differentiation. So controlling for what they're doing, if they're doing commodity rice, they might have a larger market or a more stable market. Uh, but if they're trying to move into quality differentiated products, the modernizing market allows them to capture the value through a brand uh, that would be in the case of the mill, but in case of the farm, the farmer's not branding, the farmer's not packing. And so I think that most of the gain is occurring at the level of the mills, in the produce sector, it's the cold stores, um, in the wholesale and in the retail. Okay, and uh, for the farmers, it might be a slightly higher price through the quality differentiation that's available and then you have to make the investment for that. So I would say that they can gain, but it's not really a share of a commodity market where they gain, they gain through the quality differentiation. And secondly, um, what are those people doing uh, that are you know, losing their rural broker jobs? That's a good question, I don't know the answer. That's a, we should tag them and see where they migrate to, where they probably go to the city. Uh, I think that what Tom's talking about is, is a trend that we see as well. We not only see it in Asia, we see it in Africa, but it, 
pre-farm gate, there's an important step that has to be taken, which has to do with making the small holder that's growing the crop a reliable supplier. And it's, it's that they have to learn not only to have the quality that, uh, that is required, but also if they are contracted for a certain quantity, they have to be able to, able to supply that. We in Africa are, the Gates Foundation is working with the World Food Program to, uh, and the program we call uh, P2P Purchase for Progress, of where we're, the World Food Program contracts with the smallholders for their, uh, their local production and supply. And that's where we're trying to work with the farmers to get them to actually become a more reliable supplier. Um, any other questions? We still have seven, eight minutes left. Okay, one back. Can I give the back? Then. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Janet Potter. I'm actually from the Greenpeace Science Unit. And I really just want to clarify this confusion um, over biotechnology and also genetic modification. And, and I, I think you did quite well in, in sort of explaining um, the differences between it. But really I wanted to clarify that biotechnology is, is really very wide, it's a very broad definition. And there are many techniques in there. And the only one really that, that Greenpeace is opposed to is the release of genetically modified crops. And I think that's an important distinction that we're not attacking biotechnology as wide as sense. In fact, we quote a lot of examples of market assisted selection in our reports as really as an alternative to GM technologies. So when we talk about sort of biotechnology and, and what's going to come, well, we already have rice varieties from market assisted selection actually in farms' fields. And I think I would have those as being really from biotechnology rather than sort of simply focusing on, on GM varieties of rice which may or may not be commercialised. But in fact I do have a question for the panel and I really want to get on to, to post harvest losses because we hear uh, a lot about how we've got to feed 9 million people in 2050 and I wonder if they have any thoughts on, on really on, on what, what is the relative contribution to increased productivity versus post-harvest losses that we can make to feeding this 9 billion people. There's definitely something wrong with this one. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your comments and for your question. Um, I will try to, uh, to first uh, address your, your, your first point regarding uh, biotechnology and amongst all the different uh, technologies that are available in order to uh, to, uh, to bring new, new variety, to bring uh, new ways of, uh, of cropping. And uh, <coughs> the difference of approach between, uh, between Greenpeace and between, uh, between a company like, um, like ours and Biocrop Science is uh, the way that you are considering it as a, this is as, a, as an alternate solu alternative solution. Like uh, market existing really could replace uh, biotechnology or genetic engineering. In our case, I mean, we are seeing it as something which is extremely complementary. We do believe that, uh, that we will need all the different technologies that are available in order to, to produce uh, the best variety, the most uh, well adapted varieties, the varieties that are going to be able to, uh, to withstand uh, uh, the uh, environmental challenge in which they are going to be. So this is why we are working on those, uh, on those technologies and this is why we are talking about them, we are introducing them, we are showing them to the people so that um, people can really feel and perceive what this is all about and how they are, those type of product are going to help them you know, uh, finding solutions to, to the problems that they are facing. So that's, uh, that's two different approaches and this is uh, that's where, where we are standing. Uh, regarding your second question that was uh, related to uh, gain of productivity <coughs> versus uh, post-harvest loss, um, I don't think that I would be able to quantify it. What I know for sure is that uh, the post-harvest loss at the scale, global scale, <coughs> is enormous. And this is something which is uh, outrageous if you are considering uh, the amount of food that is, uh, that is being lost post-harvest. Uh, this is also an area in which we have to find a solution. Not only to find solutions, because a lot of solutions are already there, available. 
but they have to be promoted and extend throughout the world, especially in countries who are lacking uh, the infrastructure in order to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, implement, to implement that. And I'm talking uh, here again about uh, Africa, which just, uh, you know, eventually uh, lack of uh, electricity in order to be able to cool down the grain, or having access to, to the chemical that will protect them against uh, insecticides or rodents and so on. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd just take a shot at this question on uh, the relative importance of productivity improvement versus post-harvest. Um, that's, that's actually a very difficult <laughs> question. And I'm not quite sure that there's enough um, data to, to answer it effectively. However, um, I, I, I can't say it as either or. But let's say that there is significant gains that can be made from post-harvest, um, reducing post-harvest losses. Part of those gains are going to come from what Tom just described, the, the whole structural change in the industry itself. And part of the change is, is going to come from uh, changes in, in the way one does post-harvest processing, um, storage and transport. And I think there the challenge for smallholder agriculture is quite significant because <coughs> in the same way as you would need new technologies for increasing productivity, you would need new technologies and new management practices for post-harvest processing, transport and storage if you want to reduce losses significantly. And I think the dissemination of those technologies at smallholder level has always been a big challenge and will continue to be a big challenge. And I think putting it as an either or uh, is probably not as helpful as saying we, we should be looking at both sides of the story and figuring out how we can be better at one, creating technologies pre- and post-harvest that smallholders can use, and then figuring out how to deliver these technologies to farmers. So, it's a long answer. Yeah. Uh, just a short footnote, agreeing uh, with Prabhu's point, I think, which is perfect. Um, what I found, you know, we did several studies funded by the Asian Development Bank uh, on rice value chains, and we did some very careful literature review and found a lot of claims and debate about post-harvest losses, both in the vegetable sector and in the rice sector, and claims being massive, you know, massive amounts being lost. To me, you know, sort of as a field guy, it seemed impossibly large losses were being claimed. <coughs> in fact, <coughs> when we did the study and we asked everybody along the way exactly how many kilograms they lost in their transaction, it turned out from for let's say the 1,300 mile or 1,300 kilometer trip uh, from our northern side in China to Beijing, it was five to seven percent of the product was lost altogether from farm to plate. Okay, from just Shadampur, which is just in central, you know, Uttar Pradesh, it's basically three percent. Very low losses, and that underscores the point, though, that it, when we did the careful costing of exactly what costs were occurring at the